Good morning and welcome to Pleasant Hill. We hope that you will enjoy this broadcast this morning. And we will start by singing, O oh God, our help in ages past. Let us affirm our faith as we say together the statement of faith of the United Church of Canada. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, and life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hello, beautiful people, and you are a beautiful people, and it is hard not to be together, and we miss you very much. So at this time, we join our hearts together, and we lift up the concerns of one another, and we invite you during this prayer time just to list your concerns, to list your prayers in that comment section uh, below. As we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, this is also our offering time. Understanding that an offering is not just our gifts, an offering is our prayers of concern, 
our prayers of joy, uh, ideas we have to be the body of Christ in this time when we're not allowed to be at the church. How can we be the church? So we invite you to join us in this time of offering, to join us as we lift our prayers to God, as we join together in a time of silent prayer. Shall we pray? O oh God, our help in ages past. And as we spend this time lifting our hearts to you in prayer, we are reminded of the many times that you have been with each and every one of us through different trials and different struggles within our life. How you've been with us in the green pastures of our past, how you've led us beside still waters, how you've restored our soul. We are reminded of the many times that you have walked us through those valleys of the glens of gloom, those valleys of shadows, and how you have protected us, and you have guided us, and you have led us. We are reminded we are reminded of those times in which we have stood in the presence of our enemies. We have stood in the presence of our fears. And, oh God, you have set a feast before us, a feast of peace, a feast of mercy, a feast of grace. Oh God, we come to you this morning. We pray for all these that we've lifted in our hearts. We pray for these that we find in the comments below. We lift to you each and every business owner here at Pleasant Hill and in our community. We lift to you those who are sick, those who are ill. We lift to you those who are afraid, and those who are searching. And we lift to you ourselves, O oh God. We pray, O oh God, that you would lead us through these times. That you would fill our hearts with a peace that surpasses all worldly understanding. That you would fill us with a joy in spite of. And that, Father God, you would continue to lead us home. So that we might dwell in your presence in this life. But we might live in your home for all eternity. So be with us this morning as we worship you and pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and join our voices together as we pray the very prayer your son Jesus Christ taught us when he said, Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus, I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily.
I invite you to join with me in today's scripture reading, which comes from the 8th chapter of Romans. And uh, I'm going to use selected verses this morning. But the 8th chapter of Romans, and I'm going to start in verse 15. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave to fear. But you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are God's children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, and co-heirs with Christ if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For in hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, Father God, in the next few moments we cry out to you and we ask that through your spirit, this would become the living word. And that this word might feed our souls. And that this word might transform us into the very likeness of Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. With the exception of September 11, 2001, I cannot remember a time in my life when the world 
has been more gripped by fear, when the world has been any more afraid than it is right now. Now, for some of you, I recognize that you have lived through times like this before. Many of you are children of the Depression. Many of you have lived through times of war, world wars. Many of you have faced epidemics. Many of you have faced pandemics. And you understand this fear better than any of us. Fear is an amazing power. Fear has the ability to transform us into people we really don't want to be. Fear has the ability to make us do awful and terrible things. Just last week, we saw some of the worst that human beings can be. It's fear that causes us to hoard things like toilet paper, hoard hand sanitizer, to hoard food, to hoard non-perishable items to a degree that we know is ridiculous that we'll never need. It's fear that forces us, that moves us to do such terrible things without any regard for one who might need those things more than ourselves or someone who might not be able to have those things at all. It's fear. It's a fear of scarcity. There will not be enough. And yet, Paul reminds us. Paul reminds us that as children of God, we are not a people who are to be ruled by fear. We are a people who are to be ruled by hope. This week in our Lenten journey, the question was going to be whether we would bow down to the gods of fear or we would bow down to the God of, of hope. I'll admit, just this past week, I felt those waves and I felt those winds of fear beginning to arise in my heart. Afraid for the business owners in our community, the business owners in our church, afraid for the elderly, afraid for our children, afraid of what this pandemic might bring, what tomorrow might hold, afraid that the world would never go back to the world that we knew before. We are not a people of fear. We are a people of hope. And Paul reminds us there are some things that we can cling to in this Lenten season that sort of helps hope grow at a faster rate than fear. The first one was in our creed this morning. The reminder that we are not alone. The reminder that we are not a nobody. The reminder that we are somebodies. We are children of God. And Jesus comes along and Jesus teaches us this whole new notion of God. Not a God to be feared. Not a God to try to isolate ourselves from not a God to run away from, but a God to run to and a God to cling to as Jesus is the very first who uses the term Abba, Father. When I was a child, I thought my father, earthly father, thought he could do anything. I remember my father was a choir director at Tarrant 
Methodist Church. And my dad knew that more than anything in this world, I was scared of the dark. I still don't like the dark. I don't like anything that's unknown. You want to make me afraid, stick an unknown and throw me in a dark room to marinate. But I remember every Wednesday night at Tarrant, my father would go to the church and he'd do choir practice and a, a lot of those nights I'd go with him and I dreaded the moment that choir practice was going to end because my dad was going to have to go through the church and turn out all the lights and lock all the doors. It's a prerequisite for a choir director. And he'd take me by the hand and we'd go through turning out lights and locking doors. And I always dreaded that final hallway. That final hallway, we'd step into it and he'd shut off that light and there we'd be completely in the dark with the exception of the street light that was shining through uh, the window of the door at what seemed the far end of that hall at that time. And I remember he'd just take me by the hand and uh, squeeze it hard enough where I knew he was there, and he would say, just keep your eye on the light. Well, there are a lot of times in life when I'm scared, when I feel as though I'm in the dark, I just sort of imagine grabbing my father's hand and listening to those words, just focus on the light. Years later when I grew up into a younger man, I became the choir director at Tarrant First and it was still part of the job description to lock up the doors and turn out the lights. And I would still dread turning out that light switch that my dad turned out. Then one day when it was daylight outside and I was walking to the church, I'd noticed something I'd never noticed in the 20 years of life I had lived before that. At the other end of that hallway, right by the door, there was a doggone light switch. He could have left the light on all of those years and turned off the switch as we walked through the door, but that formed my faith more than he'll ever know. Our Heavenly Father walks through and walks with us in the darkest times and whispers to us, Keep your eye on the light. And because we're his children and he's our father, he will never let go of our hand and he will never leave us alone when we're in the darkness of fear and the darkness of the unknown. We have hope because we're not alone we have hope Paul says because we know there is more to our life there is more to our being than the present circumstance that we find ourselves in as horrible as it is there is a better day coming and Paul proclaims I consider that the present sufferings are not worthy of comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. Now Paul's talking about not just a brighter day and a better day. Paul's talking about a brighter world, a better world, a brand new world. As children of God, we have hope because we know that this world is not all there is and the day is coming and the time is coming when all that brings pain, when all that brings fear, when all that brings suffering, when all that brings death will be no more. It will be a new heaven and a new earth. But in the meantime, 
But in the meantime, God continues to put those brighter days ahead of us, those green pastures ahead of us. What we experience now can't even begin to compare with the awesome glory that God has in store for us in the future. As children of God, we have hope. We have hope because we know that as long as we are in the hands of our Heavenly Father, as long as it is our Heavenly Father who leads us and guides us and directs us, then all things, all things, Work for the good of those who love God. As hard as it is to see it in the here and now, God will bring something good in the days ahead. As children of God, we have hope because of the best thing that Paul has to say. Paul reminds us that this love of God, that this love of Jesus Christ, there is absolutely nothing that can ever separate us from the love of God, that can ever separate us from God again. He says, uh, who will separate us? What will separate us? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor things present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I have no idea what tomorrow will hold. I have no idea when this pandemic will end. I have no idea when the panic that we see will subside. I have no idea what financial systems will do. I have no idea what will happen to our community businesses. I have no idea what will happen to Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church. I have no idea. The only thing I know is this. I and you are children of God. And we will not, we have never been, and we never will be alone. God is with us. And I know that nothing, nothing will ever separate us from the love of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn of dedication this morning is great is thy faithfulness.
Who will you bow down to? Will you bow down to the gods of fear? Or will you bow down to the one true living God of hope? Go in peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go in hope. Amen. We hope that in the days ahead that you will join us each day for our daily devotions. If we can help you in any way, don't hesitate to call.